So with hearts and minds united and open, let us hear from the Gospel of John. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they remained there a few days. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here, stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign, can you then, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And this is the word of God for the people of God. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. There's a book that's been floating around for a few years now that you've probably heard of, Traveling Mercies. It's by Anne Lamott. It's a great book. And in this book, Lamont shares a true story that her minister actually shared in a sermon. When the minister was seven years old, her best friend got lost one day. A little girl ran up and down the streets of the big town where they lived, but she couldn't find a single landmark. And so she was pretty frightened. And finally, a policeman stopped to help her. He put her in the passenger seat of his car, and they drove around and around and around until she finally saw her church. She pointed it out to the policeman, and then she told him firmly, you could let me out now. This is my church, and I can always find my way home from here. In many ways, the church serves as a beacon of hope that helps us find our way home. In Jesus' day, people would leave their houses and leave their livelihoods and make a pilgrimage to the temple at Jerusalem. They were acting in accordance with the holy law of their day. They went to the temple to pay the temple tax, to sacrifice burnt offerings to Yahweh, to God. It was an act of reverence that brought people throughout the region home. And like we are now, they were pilgrims. And every pilgrim is just trying to make their way in the world. What I'm saying is that we're all lost at some point or another. And we're all just trying to find home. Now, a quick word about that holy law. A moment ago, Larry read from Psalm 19, and that happens to be C.S. Lewis's favorite psalm, by the way. And Psalm 19 refers to the Torah by mentioning the law of God. It says, The law of God is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of God are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of God are right, rejoicing the heart. This stuff sounds essential. Lifeblood. Now, when we hear law of God, we project our understanding of the law onto that ancient text. And that is kind of troublesome. Because modern-day, westernized law has implications to it. We draw feelings from it. And some of those feelings are exclusive feelings, the result of exclusiveness. A more accurate translation from the original Hebrew in which Psalm 19 is written refers to the Torah as God's way, or as God's whole instruction. So the law of God, Torah, is the most beautiful way to live. It's the best possible guide to our faithfulness. It's what, in our heart of hearts, we're all trying to find.
And Psalm 19 also says, In the heavens God has set a tent for the sun. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. Nothing is hid from its heat. Richard Bruxford Culligan says, taken all together, Psalm 19 is a meditation celebrating the marvelous and challenging, simple and mysterious, joyful and solemn, free of charge and life-consuming way of God. Now that's what the people left their houses in search of when they set out for Jerusalem, this marvelous and challenging, simple and mysterious, joyful and solemn, free of charge and life-consuming stuff. But when they arrived at the temple in search of that free of charge way of God, they encountered a scene that stood in stark contrast with it. In Jesus' time, during the Roman occupation, there were walls all around the temple. And on the top of the walls, you could find Roman soldiers looking over everything, monitoring who was coming in. Now, if that was the first thing that we encountered when we showed up at church this morning, we might have turned around and gone home. And if that wasn't intimidating enough, you also had money changers and people selling animals in the temple. You couldn't enter the temple without paying the temple tax and having an animal or two to sacrifice as a burnt offering. The whole scene is really intimidating. You've got to have means to get into the temple. That doesn't sound like God's way, like the sun shining freely on the whole earth. So along comes Jesus, astute rabbi that he is, with a whip of cords saying, get this stuff out of here. Now, to be fair, those money changers and animal sellers, they weren't bad people, you know? They weren't doing anything miserly. They were doing what was required, just doing their jobs. You couldn't bring a false idol into the temple. That would be irreverent. So you needed those money changers. You needed to exchange your Roman currency, which had a picture of Caesar's face on it and read, Son of God. You had to exchange that for Jewish currency before you entered. And, in accordance with the Passover, you had to have animals to sacrifice. So thank goodness for those folks selling cattle and sheep and turtle doves. All these pilgrims traveling for miles to get to the temple needed people exchanging money and selling animals when they got there. That's the way it had always been. It was common practice. But Jesus saw those money changers and those animal sellers, and he saw how that common practice sent a message to the people that said, if you don't do this, if you don't have this, you cannot access the way of God. And Jesus, who came to proclaim the good news of God being at hand, would not tolerate God's love being inaccessible. So cracking a whip and turning over the tables of the money changers, Jesus was reintroducing the people to the sacred texts they'd always known about God's way being the source of all life, shining over everything and everyone for free. If the way of God is going to be authentic, if the love of God is going to make any difference in this world, it has to be accessible to everyone. It has to be inclusive of everyone. If we're going to preach and teach a message about the way of God being like the sun shining on everyone, then we need to make this place completely accessible to and fully inclusive of everyone. That's how the church is going to remain a shining symbol of hope, a beacon of hope for all of God's children out there and in here who are just trying to find their way home. So right now, the progress of marriage equality in our country is leading to a backlash of discriminatory laws. State by state, bills are being proposed and signed into law that would allow for us to discriminate against and exclude and withhold from and fire people 
who differ from us by sexuality or gender identity on the grounds of our religious beliefs that back up our prejudices. Now, when I was at the Capitol a couple of weeks ago for Equality Texas and Texas Freedom Network's Faith Advocacy Day, I was there with my friend, Reverend Mary Wilson, and she's the pastor of Church of the Savior in Austin. And Mary and I walked around, knocking on the doors of our representatives, pleading for them to include protections for sexual orientation and gender identity in anti-discrimination laws in our state. And office after office, Mary told the story about how her partner of 21 plus years, Betty, was once fired from her job at a restaurant for no other reason than that she was gay. It's not a suspicion. She was on the job, she was on the clock, and her boss came up to Betty and out of the blue said, yeah, I'm going to have to let you go. I just can't do queer. There was no legal recourse for her. Now, I share this with you because we live in a climate of discriminatory exclusion where the church must stand as a beacon of hope for every wandering pilgrim who is a gift from God to this world. We're all just trying to find home. That's how we're wired. That's how God made us. So if the world is going to discriminate and exclude on the grounds of religion, then God's house must stand in radical, countercultural defiance of the world so that every wandering spirit, every wayward pilgrim, every seeking soul will know that the way of God is open for all to participate in and the love of God is freely given. For everyone. Everyone's just trying to make their way in the world. Every pilgrim in here and every pilgrim out there is lost at some point in their lives and everyone is just trying to find their way home. Will the church be a beacon of hope that calls God's children home or will it be just another institution with guidelines stipulating how you got to act, who's in, who's out, who can enter, who can't. Because if the church is just another institution, then it will be torn down. People need to find home. We all need a feeling of shalom, of being comforted by the embrace of holiness in our lives. And if our restless human hearts encounter the same societal barriers and dogmas that we see in the world, When we darken the door of the church, then we'll just turn around and find home somewhere else until our hearts are at rest. We won't stop until our hearts are at rest. That's how God made us. So many of us know Ruth Schemmer. She's a longtime member of this church before she moved to Nashville a couple years ago to work at Vanderbilt, still a member of this church. And for those of us who don't know Ruth, just a quick intro. Strident leader in the congregation, chaired a bunch of different committees, was moderator of the church council a couple of times, was the chair of the pastoral search committee. Sang in the choir. Uh, Her most important legacy, however, was serving every year on the potato committee for the Thanksgiving meal. She also helped this wet behind the ears minister get his footing when I became pastor. And like all of us, at one point, Ruth was lost. It was in the mid-90s. Ruth's two daughters were middle school age. She'd gone through a divorce just a few years prior to that. She was putting herself through graduate school, trying to make ends meet. No small task for a single parent. And Ruth says that her daughters were at that age where they were impossible at times. And so when the stress and the exhaustion and the emotional turmoil of life overwhelmed her, she'd leave her house for a few minutes in the evening when it was dark, and she'd come here. She would sit in the still quiet of this sanctuary to be with God, to be with herself, and to try to find some direction home. There weren't any strings attached. She didn't have to pay a fee to enter. She just came as she was and reached out to God for hope. 
That's all it took. And then she became an integral part of this community of faith. But Ruth comes by something honestly. Ruth is not like our friend Walter Birch, another beloved church member who passed away a few weeks ago. Walter, who would rather spend one day in the courts of the Lord than a thousand elsewhere. That's not really Ruth's speed, because she's not really sure about God. She doesn't have a firm Christology, a certainty about Jesus. But even still, Ruth says, I don't know what I believe about God, but I do know what I believe about the church. I believe that the church is the embodiment of God. Did you know that you have that power? Did you know, congregation, that the world is looking at you? You, the people who make the church what it is, and the world is longing for hope and for some sense of home, and they're wondering if there's that place of belonging for them among you. With all of the world's curiosity and and skepticism, they're looking, looking for home, Maybe Jesus marching into the temple and turning over tables is saying to us, for God's sake, don't take this for granted. In his statement of faith for confirmation last year, confirmand Spencer Williamson, who's growing a foot every month, said, God to me, quite frankly, is this church. This church is the Father, Mother, Son, and Holy Spirit. All that I spiritually have is this community. Like the temple in Jerusalem, the church is where people come to try and find home. And when they darken the door, they find the people who make it what it is. The body of Christ. Jesus says, tear down this temple and in three days I'll rebuild it. And the scripture says he wasn't talk- he was talking about the temple of his body. Jesus saw the ways that we were controlling his father's house and said, tear that down. And three days later, the body will still remain because the body does not rely on institutionalized religion, but on the people who connect through the love of God. Whether it's in these sanctuary walls or at the church pantry, or at the prayer labyrinth, or in a baptismal swimming pool, or in Alabama on a mission trip, or at a restaurant for a profit share. The embodiment of God's will and way, and justice and truth, and grace and love will always lead us home. So Anne Lamont writes this, and that is why I have stayed so close to my church, because no matter how bad I am feeling, how lost or lonely or frightened, when I see the faces of the people at my church and hear their voices, I can always find my way home. For the beautiful souls that are joining this church today and for all who would come, may it be so. Be blessed and be a blessing. Let us pray. Gracious God, your way is sweeter than honey, and we taste that goodness in the freely given blessing of community. We thank you for every wandering spirit, for every wayward pilgrim, for every seeking soul that has come into this house trying to find home, for the spiritual gifts they brought to this community, and for the time we've spent together as the body of Christ. Remind us, as Jesus reminded the people at the temple, O God, to be as open to all and as loving toward all as your way and precepts are to everyone. And in that posture of openness, change our hearts and minds to see the world and everything in it as you do. Amen.